Well, welcome to the uh, Daniel Energy Partners In Basin Observations podcast. Uh, I wanted to have Leslie be our guest host today and moderator for our panel. Uh, this panel was just done at the Thrive Energy Conference, so I'm going to let it go from here. Leslie, take it away and introduce all of our panelists, and let's have a good conversation. Sounds good. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, we just finished a fantastic panel on Gen AI. Um, it's so funny, before our panel, I think every other panel had touched on some element of, of AI before we got on stage. So um, it's definitely a hot topic today. So I'm going to introduce the panelists that we had, um, and then we'll kind of talk through um, a number of the things that we discussed. So first of all, Sebastian Gass, who's the Chief Technology Officer at Quantum Energy Partners. Ben Wilson is the Director of Products and Solutions at AWS. And Colin Westmoreland um, is the Chief Innovation Officer at Inveris. Um, and each of them were able to contribute very different things um, to how they see AI specific to our industry, specific to the companies that are here at Thrive, how people are using it. Um, in the beginning, we kind of focused on specific use cases, and then we talked about implementation and adoption. So I think to start out, We'll turn to Ben, um, who we see as kind of our technical expert on all things Gen AI, maybe just to give our listening audience now an overview of what we're talking about, the definitions, some of the vernacular and language just to level set um, on education. Fantastic, and it was great to see so much generative AI discussed uh, during the conference uh, this week. It's really, really nice. But you know, let's get into what kind of generative AI is. It's becoming a hot topic. It's something that's important to our digital world. But before we dive into what generative AI is, let's talk about its broader context and where it fits. It fits under artificial intelligence. And under artificial intelligence is generative AI. So let's first start talk about what artificial intelligence is. Artificial intelligence is a part of uh, the computer science groups where they're actually trying to define systems and processes that allow them to utilize human-like intelligence to solve problems. So things like perception as an example, things like uh, language where you can actually do translations, and also problem solving. The example that's a little bit abstract, and one of the examples I like to talk about is Netflix. With Netflix, if you log on to Netflix, you get a choice of a lot of movies and TV shows and so forth. And one of the choices is because you watched. And what Netflix has done there is they have invested time and money into an artificial intelligence to recommend movies and TV shows and curate those for you so that they might be interesting to you. And one of the questions people ask is how do they know that that's actually working well? Well, they've got a lot of great data and one really good data point is Stranger Things. And when you go look at Stranger Things, you look at the audience that watches it, one in five people who view Stranger Things had never watched a horror genre movie or TV show before on Netflix. That's a pretty amazing thing that they were able to create an AI that does that. But what is generative AI? <clears throat> generative AI is a technology that consumes processes and information and actually creates new content it wasn't specifically designed to create. Think about that for a moment. We have a system that consumes data and processes that creates new content it wasn't specifically designed to make. Contrast that with what Netflix does. Netflix's solution was it was designed specifically to curate movies and provide recommendations based on your viewing habits. That was very specific. Generative AI doesn't do that. Now let's use a couple of examples to begin with. The example I like in the oil and gas industry is daily drilling reports. Imagine you might have a month or a year's worth of dr daily drilling reports and you're, cur and you're curious about, hey, what's happened in the last week, what's happened in the last month, what's happened in the last day? You can get a very quick drilling report and summary from that. Or if you have HSE incidents, you can query it and ask how many HSE incidents have we had in the last week, month. You can also get a tally of exactly how many, uh, which types of incidents there are. But you know, recently we created a generative AI to ask very specific energy questions. The one question we asked is, in the last one to three days, 
give me a, the list of the squeeze jobs that have been executed that, have, that are uh, underbalanced and over 200 bar. Now, if you've done squeeze jobs, you know these are questions you're going to ask, and we got a really good list. We didn't have to do all sorts of research. All we had to do is ask that question. And when you think about that, it provides a tremendous amount of value for energy companies. And I think oftentimes we get caught up in the consumer side of the uh, generative AI uh, push. And we all see that consumer application. For me, and working with customers in the energy industry, what we're finding is there's tremendous opportunity in the energy industry, and they are probably orders of magnitude more valuable to customers uh, than they would be in the consumer industry. So we're very optimistic about its use in the energy industry. Raise your hands if you watch Stranger Things. Oh, I did. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was great. Like, it's up in my algorithm. Oh, yeah. binge, on the I, binge the heck out of that thing. Yeah, and, no and what's, it's really funny. When I was with the Netflix people and they explained this to me, uh, you know, it's like, I don't watch horror, the horror genre, but like, I remember seeing it as, hey, you watch these shows, you might like this. And we tried, it's like, it was amazing. It really does work. It does. My, my best chat GPT example is I'm a Bush alum. I worked in the Bush 43 White House. We had a reunion and we asked it to come up with, we asked the language model to come up with names of cocktails for our party. It came up with <laughs> axis of eagle, evil elixir. It was like, um, no child left behind martini. I mean, this is new information. I guarantee you no one else had ever asked that. So I like that example, too. And, and you know what's funny is so many people tell me a similar story of trying to come up with drink names for parties. Oh, really? oh yeah. That, I hear that one quite often. It's awesome. It can be very creative. It can be very creative. <laughs> Sebastian and Colin, do you all have anything to add on level setting? Like maybe just large language model definition or um, some of the vernacular? I, I think maybe. No, go ahead. Go ahead I, I think maybe just, you know, I, totally agree with with Ben on, on the applicability in energy is just huge you know us as a, as a private equity company we are very very data driven as you would imagine uh, we have actually put together golden data records uh, from public data from private data and all the analysis that uh, that, that uh, we collect over over the years and so this technology has really made a huge impact for us there's there's three clusters of, of use cases that we've been successful in. One is personal productivity, so everybody kind of knows that. Um, <laughs> maybe finding names for drinks or, or analyzing um, reports and, and, and summarizing those. But, but for us, um, we have, for example, used it to uh, write performance reviews. So you get a lot of you know, different opinions on how a person has performed and summarizing it did, that. Did it hallucinate and, when it did um, the performance? It, 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 is, it is a danger, right? You got to definitely <laughs> well, take a look at that. I was thinking specifically um, yours. It probably hallucinated for, a lot. For, yeah, yeah, mine was incredibly good, and so it probably <laughs> did hallucinate. Um, but, but then also preparing, for example, for conferences. So we've got an important uh, limited partner conference, and we put that material through it and said, what would a limited partner may ask about this? And, and how would you as ChatGPT, or we have our own internal tool called Quick, Quantum IQ, actually answer that? So that's one category of use cases. The, the, the second one, though, is an interesting one, and that is really helping us structure our data. So we get a ton of data from uh, you know p potential companies wanting our money, and so these are these are confidential information memos, and they they can range from 50 to 100 pages, and so structuring those in a summary and storing those in a summarized fashion that we can make sense of them after the fact is is, is really really important for us. And the other good example, I think, is to prepare for an investment committee meeting. So again, an investment committee meeting obviously has, has, has a, a, a lot of work prior to the actual meeting and running the material through a, a tool like our Quantum IQ and understanding what questions should we ask, what questions do we always ask, what did we maybe miss, and then at the end of the day, is that actually a good investment? Now, obviously, you're not going to drive investment decisions based on this, but it really helps you discover blind spots that you have or just things that you have forgotten. So that's the second uh, use case cluster. The third is actually the one that, that I think is the most compelling one, and that is we've invested in petrotechnical tools that can um, analyze all of our data, that can provide us uh, with single well economics, basically helping us to make investment decisions. These tools are highly complex. Only a limited amount of petroleum engineers can actually understand and work with these tools. And now we're putting a natural language query around this, and that gives us the ability now to ask 
you know, and, and ask and do scenario analysis. So if, for example, gas would be at a, at a, at a buck 80, buck 90, what would Chevron's development program in the Permian be, and what would that do to supply and demand? Or we have a portfolio company in a certain area, and we're understanding, you know, what are the operators around that doing? What is their, you know, well economics look like? What does their IRR look like? And so all of that is providing us a platform to offer this data set to our deal team, um, analysts and, and, and professionals versus just a limited amount of money. So it's really democratizing um, the, the, the way that we can um, unlock our data. So personal productivity, you know, b basically structuring data and then democratizing access to the data is where we see a lot of value. So, so before you uh, make the final decision on an investment, do you, do you ask quick or whatever this general AI model is, hey, should we make this investment? Why not? Why not? I mean, you it, just it, don't have it, to rely it, on. I mean, you, you wouldn't. You wouldn't probably rely on that. But it is very interesting, and there is definitely context that a model like that can see that a human might not see. Have you ever compared the two? Like, hey, we decided to invest here, and. Your model said, ah, oh, that's a bad one, but you decided to invest anyways, or the other way around? We're, we're playing around with it, but obviously the technology is not quite there yet. <laughs> okay. Well, that raises one of the most important things, I think, about Gen AI, which is you can get the data. You have the high quality data, you can get it to generate suggestions for you, but at the end of the day, you have to use your own brain power, or some, you know, some governance um, piece has to be in place there to make sure it's the right, the right thing for you. So Colin, as long as we're on use cases, um, congratulations on the rollout of Instant Analyst this week at Inveris. Um, I think you. I called it correctly. It's the large language model um, trained specifically on industry data. So can you tell us about that and, and everything else that y'all are doing at Inveris? Yeah, I, on this? I, am, I am happy to. And um, the examples that Sebastian Ben just gave are great examples. So like just the Inveris path over the course of the last year has been pretty wild with, with Gen AI and the, you know, all the excitement around it. Um, we're looking at, I won't touch as much on the internal use cases because Sebastian nailed a couple of those. We're actually kind of testing in-house as well around efficiency gains and productivity. Those are great. I think those are real um, as well, but um, focus one that more on the external use cases. If you rewind a year ago when we, when we looked at this, the, the first, I think, immediate reaction from our technical team and, and executive team was, is this really going to be helpful? Like, how, how helpful can this be? We've seen some of this before. We've been leveraging AI for decades, right? But like, well, what's the what's the big differentiator around this? And then a month into it, we realized, oh, this is this is different. Um, this is real. This is this is not a flash in the pan. It's here to stay. So at that point, you know, the, the thought press process quickly goes to, um, are we going to be winners in this and losers? And, and we think about that from the energy space too. And, and if if the answer is yes, then the next question is, well, why and how are you actually going to win? And um, so our, our first journey w was exploring, and and very quickly, you know, to your point, realized that some of these public models are awesome if you want to generate cocktail names, um, or <laughs> if you want to, you know, create images or do certain things. But from a practical, you know, practicality standpoint, how is this going to actually help folks? And uh, Sebastian mentioned data, 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 and, and and what we found very quickly is on these models, it is again like everything else, you know, it's the, it the outputs are going to be based off the quality of the inputs. So it's trash in, trash out. And here we are sitting on three decades of priding ourselves in cleaning, structuring, curating, uh, analyzing, and providing insights on energy data, right? So it seems like a no-brainer. Um, you know, I'm simplifying it. My tech team has put in some Herculean efforts to get this release out. But um, as we look at this, we said, well, why can't you train it just on the energy space? So it understands the jargon. It understands what you're actually asking. So if you're asking about frac trends, in the Delaware Basin, it's not going to tell you what fracking is about and about the state of Delaware, right? Like it's just not it's just not going to do that. It actually answers the, the questions that you wanted to answer, and um, it's been it's just been incredible. Like I mean, the the results are amazing. Uh, it, it is something we put it on a mobile app, so it's in your pocket if you're walking into a meeting. Uh, you're trying to reference something that you read three weeks ago and you don't know where to find it. It's actually giving you the source documentation behind it. So that's that's kind of, that was low hanging fruit for us and that's what we wanted to focus on first. The second theme, there, there's three of these. Second is is really about the way that we believe people will engage software in general. You've seen some of the co-pilot releases that are out there, but it, just in general, software is going to take a much more conversational approach to how you use it. Um, the, the barrier to entry as far as in the, in the learning curve around software, I think is just going to decrease by magnitudes um, over the course of the next five years. And, and that doesn't, you know, our, our software is going to be the same. So, so coming up with the multivariate uh, benchmarking chart in, you know, in the Eagleford, you just ask it. 
and he gives it to you. Now imagine those two concepts around the user experience and the instant uh, analysts of aggregating all the data and providing insights. Marry those two together, and the workflow is simply you ask the question, you get the answer and some narrative around it. It gives you the option to visualize it if you want to. Go ahead and do it there without even knowing how to use the platform. And I think that is, that's imminent. Like that's not um, far-fetched or anything else. And then I think the third is actually dropping these models behind a secure firewall with our clients, allowing them to leverage their own proprietary data to solve um, real issues around asset development or well-design or uh, you know, predictive maintenance or um, any of these models they probably already have in-house around well spacing or cost modeling. And then you drop in a large language model that's already trained in the energy space and it's just, you know, extrapolates that out in, in a manner that we've never seen before. So I think you know, those are three themes. That's not a comprehensive list of how we feel like we can leverage this, but um, it's, it's pretty mind blowing, I, I have to admit. And so covering, you know, we see where it's being used specifically, but such an important piece of this in the adoption is how are our teams using it? What is the upskilling that's needed? Um, and then we talked further on adoption around capital, um, around IP and cyber, but let's start with workforce um, and kind of maybe tell us about how some companies are training their teams on this, what are some challenges, you know, what are some wins? At the end of the day, it's supposed to make us more productive. It's not supposed to necessarily remove heads. It's supposed to increase the productivity, right? So how, how are you all thinking about that, Sebastian? Well, we were actually just chatting over lunch about it, and I, I think the premise that the tool just basically gets deployed and gets used, I think, is wrong. Um, so I do think that it takes lunch and learns. It does take you know, um, an expert to show how to prompt these engines. Um, obviously, if you have an engine that's trained on the you know, public internet versus you have an Inveris engine that's trained on very proprietary data, the way that you converse with those engines might actually be very, very different. And also, you know, the art of actually getting the question answered that, 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 that you specifically want to get answered is, is not trivial. Um, and, and so, um, it, it um, I think, takes a lot of blocking and tackling. It takes a lot of reinforcement. Um, in order to deploy those kinds of tools within a company to really change decision making. And I think that's, that's what we're after. Um, decision making today, I would say, in companies is pretty broken. Um, and the way that it works in a lot of our companies is that uh, the CEO asks a question, 20 analysts go and, and answer it. Uh, highly effective, highly expensive as well. And so this technology can really turn this, turn this around and, and can actually get the cost of a question to nearly zero. And so if you have the cost of a question be zero, then you can really focus on asking very, very clever questions. So it's a very, very different approach to decision making as what we have today. We loved your Ferrari versus F-150 analogy on this earlier on, well, on I, I, adoption. I think, well, I, I think, you know, so you got to, I mean, my point was really you got to have a vision and you got to have a commitment and you got to start with an end in mind. I mean, a lot of what we hear is like, oh, Gen AI is in the news. Everybody wants some, but nobody quite knows what exactly that means. And so it takes a village to make it happen. So I was saying, you know, Ben from AWS puts a Ferrari in your garage, but it's got a stick shift. Um, and then you get beautiful data from Inveris and now you bring that home to your company and one third says, you know, well, I really like that Ferrari and I, and I love stick shift, so let me drive it. Um, then you got another third that says, well, I really would like to drive it, but you got to teach me how to drive a stick. And then the, the, the last third, you know, unfortunately would say this is Texas, um, F-150 ones, F-150 forever. And, and so, you know, how do you get an entire workforce convinced? Um, we, we actually, do this in a way that we actually look at the user stats. And we say, who has used this tool in a month? And we've had one example where um, not all people that uh, should have used it used it. And on a Monday morning call, we reiterated that. And, and sure enough, now uh, many more of that group are using the tool. So um, it, it, it's hard work, and it takes blocking and tackling. Colin, how do you see that, and how do you incentivize, I guess, maybe uh, folks to really take the time to learn how to use it effectively? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a good question, and, and obviously over the course of the last year, our, our organization's a little bit different just because of an army of developers that we have that everybody wants to be focused on this. This, this is 
you know, this is the cool thing to work on. Um, and, and we're building some internal tools. I think for us to take a little bit of a different slant on this, we just wanted to make sure that we had clear a clear vision, um, going back to Sebastian's point of what we wanted to accomplish with it. So we were focused, we had buy-in from the top down, from our, from our board of directors to our executive teams. And um, what came out of that was focus on, okay, these are the things we wanna work on and this is how we wanna do it. And um, start small and scale. So what actually, you know, if you're gonna fail, fail fast and figure out what worked, what didn't work, and then figure out how you can then empower the entire organization instead of a very, very small group of people. That's something that we're um, certainly focused on. And from an adoption standpoint, people are already gonna use Gen AI in some way, shape, or form. Um, saw a study last week that said uh, just in the last five months, uh, weekly usage of some type of Gen AI solution has doubled in the energy space. And that, that's not surprising to me, but I think that the scary thing about that is if you're an organization that's, that's um, I don't wanna say ignoring, but if you're not paying attention to it, it could be a very, very fragment, fragmented approach to how people are using it. And, and without the focus, as Sebastian mentioned, and without the top-down direction of, um, hey, the things we wanna be using this for need to add enterprise value here, then you run the risk of people doing all types of different things that could potentially, from a security standpoint, could actually harm your business. And certainly through you know, IP uh, loss. A hundred percent. And you, you can imagine it, uh, you know, with billions of data points flowing through uh, it, our systems, how seriously we took that. So I think it's, um, I think you have to know that people are going to use it. I think you have to embrace a sense of and, and culture of innovation and. You want to encourage people to lean in to it. Don't be scared of it. Don't be scared about your jobs. It's going to make you more efficient. It's going to empower you. Um, but at the same time, there has to be a level of discipline in the organization to where you make sure that what you're using it for and what they're spending their time on is not a distraction. Right. Um, it, it's, it's adding value, right? And I, I think for us, that's been, um, I think we've been successful with that and internally, you know, as, as, as seen with this most recent release, but we're going to, you know, that's just the beginning. I, I was talking to uh, our, our chief product officer yesterday and uh, mentioned it on the panel that a lot of a lot of people probably have kids that are gamers and, and some of the, you know, the Xbox stuff coming out, it, it, you know, you, I just watched my son playing some of those games. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And his comment to me was with where we are on, on AI and Gen AI, he's like, we just introduced Pong to the uh, to, to the world. He's like, like, we're just starting. And um, Man, that analogy kind of floored me. And I was like, God, that's going to be exhausting to keep up, which is why mentioning these partnerships and, and, and trying to do it yourself just seems like, um, man, that seems like a way to lose, uh, uh, right. honestly. Ben, do you have anything to add on that or do you want to go to capital? I mean, we talked about capital on the panel. I think that's a nice segue into it. Um, you know, say I'm a mid cap OFS company, I may have some, you know, enterprise application that I'm using in my HR systems, maybe my legal, I probably have predictive maintenance technology on my equipment. What kind of capital is required to move to the next step? Um, what kind of capital should be invested and, and where is it spent first? Ben, you wanna start? For me, <clears throat> whenever I think about these problems, I think about, let's start with one problem first and work backwards from that problem to see how to go solve it. Because the first thing you have to do is be able to get some confidence that the answers you're getting out are consistent with the answers you're expecting. And I think oftentimes when you start with a new technology, it's very easy to get started with something like this and just go all in and spend a little bit too much money. But once you start making those decisions, you start seeing the value of it, you can then apply it across to other ones. And so I look at it as, as kind of a, an upward trajectory of a curve. But <clears throat> the thing I try to tell people up front is, if someone tells you you need to invest $20 million today, that's probably not the right answer. You may eventually get into 20 million a year or maybe even more depending on the size of your company. But to begin with, start, start with something you can manage, you can go do. One of the things we find when people start using generative AI is, is something a little bit counterintuitive, is that the people who are least skilled in, in the capability you're building in generative AI become better. Your best skilled people get very, very, very small, incrementally better. And that is something that's a really amazing thing that's counterintuitive that people don't really think about. But if you think through the process, what you've, which, and you think and you use any of these generative AI tools, you find, hey, I'm, I didn't know anything about this topic, but I feel smarter today because I was able to ask these very simplistic questions. So for me, that's how I think about the capital allocation. That's how I think about some of these uh, use cases that people are going through. 
Sebastian, how do you see yeah, it in your portfolio? I, I companies? would second that. I mean, you need to take a value-based approach. So for us, what we do, I mean, first of all, not all problems are going to be solved with Gen AI. So you know, the decision that that you're trying to underline with with AI needs to be probabilistic. You need to have a data set. You probably need to be okay with not fully being able to explain the answer. Um, you probably need to be okay with not being fully able to replicate the answer, right? And then. Um, I think given the data sets that you've got available, given you know, some of the partnerships that you've got available, I mean, I think there is a, um, a cost value, business value equation that drives a portfolio where you can think big but start small and, and kind of iterate into it, just like, uh, just like Ben is alluding to. I think you make a really good point too, is like, if your expectation is I'm gonna get the same answer over and over for the next three years, that's the wrong expectation. The expectation should be, hey, the Diamondback acquisition occurred in 15 minutes, I'm going to go ask that question. Had I, had I asked it 15 minutes earlier, it had given me one answer. Because it's ingested new data, it's going to give me another. Now that's an extreme example, but there's, you have to think about these models are constantly getting new data. So the expectation that you're going to get the exact same answer in the exact same context is, I, I think, a little bit outmoded. Yeah, no, I, I would agree 100%. We learned that. Uh, very early, early on that um, just dropping in one of these models and throwing a bunch of data at it, that, that, that doesn't, uh, that's not going to get you what you want. If you're in an industry in, a, in, in, in the energy space, um, you can't have hallucinations. Like if you're actually making decisions, you can't, it, it's a fact-driven industry and, and that's what people want. And um, give you an example, um, a, another thing that you have to try to figure out is, you know, how do you weight the significance of certain things that happen? So if you ask a question, you logically want to weight things that are, you know, more chronologically recent than something that happened three years ago. But those are those are tweaks that every organization is going to kind of have to make if you don't want to use just an out of the box, um, you know, if you're not comfortable with just general answers. And that's certainly what we had to do. And um, I, and I would say on the on the capital expense uh, side of things, I think just the mindset of an organization needs to be it's an investment. So meaning um, if you're expecting to just get immediate short-term value out of, uh, out of what you put into it, I don't know if that's the right approach. I, I think in some scenarios there's certainly use cases um, that you can get instant value, but if you're trying to build something yourself, uh, it, it's going to be investment. It's going to be a lot of front-end um, cost. It, it's not cheap, but, uh, but if you believe in what you're going to get out of it, then um, as we do, it's certainly f um, worth it for, for our clients and, and the work that we're doing, um, both internally and externally. And all of that value comes back to the quality of the data. And we spent time yeah. talking about that on the panel. And I, I, just, I think you can't underestimate that that's the most important piece of it. Um, we kind of talked through how, how do you maintain trustworthiness of the data in companies? Um, what's the governance oversight of the data? Is, is there a chief data officer? Um, uh, Colin, I think you mentioned that you heard some companies are doing that. Ben, I'm sure you have some experience with that. Um, how, how do all of you see how you're keeping that, that quality yeah, there? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep my answer brief because I think it's we're in a unique position around data where that's our life. I mean, uh, data quality, we don't have a business if our, if our data doesn't have um, all types of thresholds of quality control. And, uh, and it's no different here. I think the, the biggest piece for us is making sure the data was secure. So there's all kinds of risk associated with how you're using this data. If that data goes out to a public model, it's out there. Um, and, and so we spent the better part of two quarters making sure that we were partnering with the right people. And then um, as we're relying on our data to train it, the good news is we, we have an army of analysts that essentially QC our data every single day because they're using that data to actually, and they're, they're specialists on a, on a basin or, or a sub-level sub basin, and they know if things are wrong or right or if something's you know, inaccurate, and you know, obviously we have teams of, of QC folks all over the world, but um, I think that's the important piece of it. It's, again, it, it's, if you don't have the quality data, what do you expect to get um, from an output? That has to start there. Yeah, and I'd say the other thing too is it's about the quality data and you have to have it, but you can also try to leverage generative AI to help you get to that quality, to increase that quality, yeah. help you figure out how to structure it. I think the, the journey quantum has gone on is an interesting one. I think uh, Sebastian has got a great story on that, so. 
I'll let him speak. Yeah, I mean, I was actually also going to talk a little bit. I mean, on the data quality side, I completely agree with, with Colin. I mean, to a lesser degree, we're, we're obviously smaller than an Inveris, but we also have a data governance organization. We've got um, folks that create data quality rules and, and, and create these golden records that I was talking about. But it's also quantity of data, you know, and, and, and I think that that's, um, has been really a driver for us because we've got all of this training data where we can actually train these AI um, algorithms and models with. And so the combination of quantity and quality is obviously what, what is the secret sauce. But um, not many people have, or not many corporations have environments where they can actually tap into all of that data. And so we have all of our portfolio companies as well as the mothership, so to speak, on one data foundation. And for us to utilize that data to train AI is, 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 is literally at the press of a button. And so I think that that's um, a huge advantage for Quorum. Um, from the director perspective, just, you know, the kind of the education that we get is all around that. And, and we're really taught about the risks that happen in, within the models if the data is not accurate, um, some bias risks, um, certainly on workforce, you know, there's we, we didn't really talk about regulation in the earlier panel, but you know, there's there's legislation in New York that you have to have a human being oversee any kind of Gen AI information that has anything to do with hiring someone. Um, how do you all see, you know, kind of those, those risks um, inherent in the models? Because you spend all this money and this time, you build it, you get a little wonky on the data, and you have to start over from scratch, right? I don't think you have to start over from scratch, but I always akin it to, you know, if you go look at a large Excel spreadsheet, five or six tabs, lots of data in it, how confident are you that every cell is correct? I'm not sure there are many people who can say, hey, I'm 100% confident that that is 100% correct. And you have to approach generative AI a little bit in the same way. Is it's, you've loaded a lot of great data, you've been able to ask a good question, but it's up to a human to decide, is this the correct answer? And it's up to the tool to provide things like, hey, here's a link, on where I got that information. You click on the link, it should bring you someplace that then highlights where that inf exactly where that information came from. There are things like, hey, I, I could provide a, uh, a glossary of terms that, I use, that, that the tool used to be able to say, hey, here's how I'm, uh, I'm putting my answer together. So you can go look at a definition and go, I agree with that definition or not. The objective is to be able to make it easy for a human to look at the answer and go, yes, that's correct, or no, that's wrong, it's hallucinating. So critical for that experience in the user. Yeah, I, I would agree wholeheartedly. And this, uh, on our instant analyst release, we had our intelligence and research teams using that for six months. And, and the reason being is they know the data. And, uh, and, and that is, I, I think my only, um, my only recommendation from a, you know, at, at the highest level is you just have to be flexible, like meaning, it's going to continue to get better and better, like just of what we've seen over the course of the last year. It, I mean, shoot, the last three months, things are just coming out. It will continue to get better, and I think you just have to have a, a flexible mindset um, when you start to use these tools that, uh, you know, everything's probably not going to be perfect uh, right out of the gate. I mean, you alluded to kind of the cyber executive order um, on, on AI, right, wh wh which is really interesting. I think it, it starts also with understanding within a company, where do you actually even use AI? And now you've got third parties bringing AI, you know, into your environments. And, and so actually understanding, you know, where it's being used for what purpose, I think is, is an important beginning. And then for us, you know, we have uh, a private cloud on top of a, of a public cloud. We call it the quantum energy cloud, and this basically powers our AI and so everything stays private and there's access privileges because obviously there's also highly sensitive information that's being fed into these AI tools and so that is um, how we're handling it. And we have an AI ethics policy as well that uh, basically everybody um, with, w within our corporation has to, has to sign and, and, and that's basically what we obey um, by. But yeah, le lots, lots more to come in this area, that, I believe. That, that, that policy is one of the first things our CTO jumped on, right, about a year ago. Yeah. Like, okay, we, need, we hold on, time out. We need to make sure we what, get our arms around this. Well, what are some of the across the board policies that you're seeing? I know I hear <clears throat> because of the risk of putting 
proprietary company information into an external model, you know, there are a lot of companies that are like, you cannot use any Gen AI yep. other than our in-house one yep. while you're at work. There's specific rules against that or for a work purpose. Are you seeing that kind of across the board, most yeah. companies? Yeah, and, and keep in mind, again, going back as a, as a data and analytics uh, and intelligence firm, we have a lot like that. That's our business. That's our livelihood. So we are we are maniacal about making sure that um, you know we, we mitigate the risk on that happening. But uh, what I would say is one of the first things we concluded was people are going to use it. So we need to figure out and give them another way to use it. And so we actually one of the first things we developed with our, was our, our own internal version of a Chat GPT, for example, and um, and said, listen, if you want to use it, if you want to figure out where you want to take your kid for their birthday and get a bunch of ideas. Use this one. Use our uh, version. Use our version. It's behind our firewall. You're not. You're not. There's not even an option to uh, to yeah. upload. You know, any data that's going to get outside of that. I don't think many companies are doing that yet. It, I, you it, know, it, it at was, least not the ones necessary. that I work with. But I see yeah. the. I mean, that IP risk is real. And and so we talked in the panel about how IP and cyber are linked. I mean, cyber obviously all your data is in the cloud anyway. But the IP risk on this is what kind of keeps some people away. So Ben, do you want to kind of? It's a, it's a legit problem. I mean, if you're using a public version of a Gen AI tool, once you hit that enter button, you've kind of given up that data set. And so we see a lot of customers going and building solutions internally so that they can have something their, uh, their employees can use. And it drives a different behavior too. The behavior is, hey, I only, it also brings that level of, hey, this is our data, we don't want to expose it. And it brings that out because I think oftentimes when you start having a cloud, everyone's connected to the internet, it's easy to send things back and forth. And we're seeing that heightened understanding of what's truly IP and what's not. And uh, believe it or not, like emails is a good example. People constantly use some of these tools just for email, but the information that's in that email can be extremely confidential. And people just don't think about it that way. And so we're seeing a lot of this and there's going to be a lot more education that's necessary to protect that IP. Absolutely. What else did we not you know, hit on um, in this conversation that we talked about earlier? I mean, um, you know, challenges to the workforce, the regulatory piece we didn't, um, but I think, you know, a lot of impending regulation around IP for sure that we see kind of bubbling up the federal level. I, not necessarily related to that, but I'm just thinking about things we've chatted about yeah. uh, over the last day or so. And um, I just think it's, you know, if, if, if you if you have a, if you've got a company and, and you know our, our most, you know, prized assets are our employees and, and it's the people and um, th there is certainly some anxiety um, across different pr professions or personas within within companies about what does this mean to me? Um, is it is it risky? Is this going to take over for what I'm doing? And I think. Um, the importance of making sure that, that your employees, you're upskilling your employ employees, so you're not replacing them. Um, right. What you're doing is you're making them much more effective on what they're doing. That is a, that you know, I don't know if that's a skill or if it's a culture or what, what you want to call it, but all I know is that it's important. And um, we, we've dealt with it, and I think we've done a good job at, at, uh, of doing it at Inveris, but empowering and making sure that with this movement, you're rising everyone. Ben kind of pointed that earlier. It's every employee is going to be more productive and more efficient and should be excited about it. So, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't feel scary. It, you know, everybody, you know, many moons ago, no one used the internet. Yeah. Okay. And, and, Until and, Al Gore invented and, it. And, 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 yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody does now. And there's no specialized team for internet usage at a company. It's just, it's a part of our you know, DNA and what we do every single day. Right. So um, that, that's the only thing, I, additional thing I would say just, say just about, you know, from a, you know, just right. go ahead and inspire people as opposed to scare them. That's right? a very important close out. Ben, what, what do you well, have? Well, Vince Cerf is the one who invented the internet. So just to be <laughs> correct, <laughs> I've, met, I've met him several times. I know him. Uh, but like the way I think about these things is I think employees can be nervous, but what, what you're really able to go do is to more thoroughly interrogate the problem or challenge you're facing so you don't miss a point and you're going to have a better understanding of how to go present that information so it's more meaningful so i look at it as kind of like if you think about excel if you think about like spreadsheets back in the day people did everything by hand and now with spreadsheets it's like oh i always get the correct answer 
I think this is kind of where we're going with this is you now have the chance to interrogate something and some people are embarrassed to ask questions and all that stuff. Now you've got this like bot, you just go type the questions and get some answers and you're gonna, I think you're gonna see more thoughtful results out of it that provide you an, an, a, a, a perspective you might not have had before. And that's where I really encourage people to think about like, what, is that really gonna be the answer for that? And I think many times it's gonna be the answer. Sebastian, it, how do you, it, you I, I completely this? agree. I mean, I would say the same slightly differently. Uh, and that is really, it, 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 it is a cultural change that is happening. And it is a cultural change towards asking more, asking better questions and coming more prepared. And, and that not everybody will embrace as enthusiastically um, as, as the three of us. And so I, I, I do think it, 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 it does need some reinforcement and it does need some really good use cases, some really good tools, some really good technology in order to make this persuasive. Yep. But, but it will happen. Agreed. You guys are leading, forging the path in making sure that everyone here at Thrive <laughs> understands it. So I enjoyed being on Gen AI panel with you. Um, thanks so much to Josh and the team and to John. Um, and I think that's all we've got. <laughs>